scare play. That's all. <laughs> I love it. I mean, if I had to be there, I got used to it, and I really would. That's where I was comfortable. At, you know, you can be comfortable when you're on a mission. But it was very. I don't know. I just got used to it, and I had the best view. I could see everything. And uh, sometimes I didn't want to see it all. That's the way it goes. I don't know. I, I guess we had, every mission was different, of course. Some we got a lot of flack and fighters, and some we didn't. But one that really stands out in my mind is the last mission on Christmas Eve. We were fogged in. We didn't get off for the Battle of Bull until Christmas Eve. And we flew that night, that day, morning, pardon me. And uh, we, we couldn't see the runway. I don't know about the pilot, I guess he did. But we were, you know, in the waste watching out. And uh, you, you, you just once in a while see a light flat. And we took off. A plane in front of us somewhere, one of them, blew up, hit a hit trees or something, and we kept going. But it was a terrible day uh, in order to bomb for whatever we bombed that day in uh, on the bulge. It had to do with people, I guess. I don't know what the target was. I was a gunner. I didn't, I didn't know all that stuff. But the one thing about it, coming back, was the same story. We couldn't land at the field. We had to land at a British Museum. <laughs> And the next day they trucked us back. But I guess of all of them, that was, the whole day was a really uh, yawn edge, you know, because of that terrible fog and that, uh, that horrible uh, experience, because it was not fun. Of course, none of them were fun, you know, but we were always glad to get back and thank the Lord for that. I've th thanked him ever since for just seeing me through. All my crew's gone. Every one of them has passed away. I'm the only one alive yet. And uh, I don't, I just don't know why, but I thank God every day for what he's doing. And I certainly, that's, that's enough. I guess I've talked enough. <laughs> if we're glad you're here, thank you, sir. Dr. Raver, you were a bombardier. You were the point of the spear. You were in charge of making sure that our bombs dropped on target. If you could just comment about one mission in particular or one memory you have about your service in the 8th, it would be greatly appreciated. Well, I recall, I can recall many missions. They all were the same, really, to a large degree. We had a job to do, we flew in, Sometimes we got a little flack, sometimes we had fighters, sometimes we didn't. We didn't know what we were going into, but we went. Because we loved our country, and we were fighting for our country, not for ourselves. So I recall the worst mission I think I ever flew was at the very end of the world of a war, and we went to Berlin. And always, we sat in in the morning and we were critiqued. We were told what the target was going to be, where we were going, what the weather was like on the way in, how the weather was over the target, <coughs> and what we could expect, expect in flak and what we could expect in fighters. But really, we really never knew it was a, a hodgepodge of market that you there was praying you got through it. And I'll never forget that one mission, they said, we cannot tell you what you're going to dump, what you're going to bomb. We can tell you it's a military target, and that is all. Now, anyone who doesn't want to fly, <coughs> it's not necessary, and it will not be held against you. Well, of course, no one left the room. Everyone stayed, <coughs> and they briefed us. And I'll never forget, when we started the bomb run, coming into Berlin, and the Germans had thrown up a box that you had to fly through a 
of flak. I mean, it was like years ago when they said, Gee, we have, you could walk on that flak. <laughs> you couldn't walk on this flak. It, you wouldn't have had any chance. And every squadron ahead of us, and I'm sitting in, up at the bomb site, and I could see ahead one or two planes, three or four planes would go out. When we got pretty close, just before I was due to start my run, the squad, the bombings in front of me, this is not a nice picture, but I can never forget it and never erase it from my mind. It's the worst thing I ever saw in the war. The bold turret gunner took a direct hit from anti-air red fire. Now you have to realize that this bold turret, I guess, was about 36 inches in diameter, and even a guy like me would get in there, could get in, and he'd get him in a fetal position, and his legs would go down alongside 250 caliber machine guns. Well, his door, the door popped open. He popped out, but his legs were caught in the machine guns, and he dangled in front of us as we were getting ready to go on this run. Thank God, eventually, he was set free. And we were, it was our turn to go through this. I can't explain it other than a miracle from God. The flight com completely stopped. We flew through that, dropped our bombs, made our turn to go away, and when we looked back, that box was, was full again. So we just we just put the hit there. When all those anti-aircraft guns were had to be, they must have been. Out of, they should have been out of synchrony. It wouldn't have been like that. They must have been all synchronized and they ran out of ammunition and they had to reload the guns. And I'll never forget that mission. And if you ask me what we bombed, I'd have to say, I really shouldn't tell you. But I'm going to tell you anyhow. We heard on rumor, strictly rumor, that we had bombed a heavy water plant, which is the precursor to an atomic bomb. Germany was awful close to doing everything it wanted to do. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Thank you very much. <laughs> Luffy, if um, you could share a story of your, your service to the 8th, one mission in particular, or one event that happened while you were in service to our nation, we would be honored to hear it. My worst mission, and the one I really had doubts that I would su survive, was my 22nd mission. I had flown 21 missions with the original crew that I went overseas with, they had finished their tour and been returned to the States. So I still had four missions to fly. I was assigned to be an instructor pilot for this mission in the lowest squadron of the lowest group in the Purple Heart corner, closest to the flag. And I was leading this three plane element. As we approached the target, we were on the bomb run, and all of a sudden, this enormous black defense was thrown out, as we just described, in a box to completely encompass the found the formation. The Germans, this was on October the 8th of 1943. The Germans had perfected a radar direction of their anti-aircraft uh, fire and a 
electronically um, fired. So all it required was just human uh, um, Hitler youth to load the guns. And it was all automatic. And we were flying five miles above the earth. 25 to 50,000, uh, 25 to 29,000 feet. <clears throat> Bitterly cold. The cold was one of our worst enemies. 50 to 60 degrees below zero. And we were unpressurized. So we were literally freezing to death all the time. And as we approached the target, normally the fighters, the, the Luftwaffe, would hold back and allow the anti-aircraft guns to damage us just enough to force us out of the formation. Because once you left the formation, you were a dead duck. They picked you off at leisure. Nevertheless, on this particular mission, first time we'd ever experienced it, we saw their fighters flying through their own flag. They were subject to being shot down by their own anti-aircraft as we were. We'd never witnessed that before. But on the bomb run, which was a total of about six minutes, out of the 18 airplanes of the bloody 100 bomb, 12 were shot out of formation. And I suddenly looked up and realized that I was the only element leader left still airborne. So I fired a flare to form on me and looked up and uh, at about the same time, I had a direct flight kit in the number three engine, so I was only flying on three out of the four engines, which meant my airspeed was somewhat reduced. But nevertheless, being the only flight leader, uh, element leader still flying, I formed the other five ships, and behind me, slightly higher than was coming the 95th bomb group, who had lost an entire squadron of six ships. And so I radioed them and said, I see you've lost your low squadron. Can we fill in and get mutual protection from your formation? And they said, certainly. So we joined them, and that was the only way that we managed to survive that mission and, and get back. But let me just say that as hairy-headed college kids, which we were 20, 21 years old, we didn't know what the hell we were doing when we went to war. We didn't have any conception of what perilous danger we were going to be confronted with. We did it as a duty. We answered the call and rose to the occasion because it was the thing to do. Everybody in World War II was instantly mobilized, galvanized into mobilization when Pearl Harbor occurred. So we had the total support of the population, the home front heroes, as I call them now. And without them, we would never have prevailed. Amen. And I'm trying in my remaining time to get a national day of recognition of the hometown heroes who've never been recognized, and without them, we would never have prevailed. I'm a proud member of the 8th Air Force, the bloody 100th Bomb Group, 
which accidentally became notorious, as did the 8th Air Force. Because without the 8th Air Force, the European Air War would not have turned out as it did. So I'm very grateful that destiny, or fate, or whatever you want to call it, I call it damn luck. <laughs> because bottom line, it doesn't matter how well you perform your duty, how well you answer the call to defend your freedom. It is just pure dumb luck if you survive. In 99 years, I'm goddamn grateful. <laughs> and I'm still here. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, before I turn it over to Buck Schiller for, for the final comments of the evening, um, a nice round of applause for our World War II veterans.